Greetings, boils and ghouls. Last month was Halloween, and with it came a variety of films, some spooky, some not so much. The first two films I watched are technically September movies, but I'm counting them as October since they both released on the 30th towards the very end of the month. The first film I saw was the long-awaited sequel to Disney's Hocus Pocus. Now I'm not a huge Hocus Pocus fan, I know a lot of people absolutely love it for some reason, but it's one of those films that I let off easy simply because it's set on Halloween. And while I didn't love the original, I thought there was a very good chance that a sequel could be good, especially since it had been in development for so very long. But boy was I wrong, I don't know how they did it, but they somehow managed to make a worse film. One of the first things I noticed watching this movie is how grey and lifeless everything looks. The film is set on Halloween, but it doesn't embrace that colorful, fun Halloween atmosphere, which would honestly be my top priority if I were directing a Hocus Pocus sequel. The main characters are extremely forgettable, with most of the focus put on the Sanderson sisters. There's a lot of jokes about the three witches messing around with modern technology. It's not very funny and kind of serves as a reminder that not much has really changed since the 90s, or at least the examples they thought of just weren't very good ones. The recent Beavis and Butthead movie did the same concept but better. These children eating witches also get a bit of a redemption arc at the end, which feels very fan pandery and kind of gross. This is just one of many Disney films in recent years that tries to turn the villains into some sort of hero. It's an incredibly lame trend that I really wish would just go away. I'm sure a lot of people will enjoy this film for nostalgic reasons, but not I, said the Neil. It's a thumbs down for me. The next movie I watched was a Netflix original animated movie created by Kid Cudi. Everyone talking about this movie is comparing it to Spider-Verse, which yes, it does look a lot like Spider-Verse, like an awful lot, and it really does feel like Kid Cudi watched Spider-Verse and said, I want my movie to look like that. But I can't really fault him for that either, because the animation is really what makes this work. Here is a love story that could have easily been told in live action, but is heightened through the power of animation. Enter Galactic is a very chill yet gorgeous film that also doubles as a music video of sorts, incorporating music from Kid Cudi's newest album. It's an animated movie for adults with cussing and sex, but not in the usual way where it's done solely for comedy. It's an adult animated film that actually feels adult. I enjoyed it, and I will give it a thumbs up. The next movie I watched was Hulu's Hellraiser, the 11th movie in a franchise that only consists of two good movies. Now, it may seem foolish to get hyped up over a Hellraiser film, but this one was directed by David Bruckner, who did last year's The Night House and a couple of other recent horror movies and shorts. I watched this movie and my thoughts are, it's pretty good. Not great, but pretty good. Unfortunately, I do share similar thoughts on the first two Hellraisers. It's never been my favorite horror franchise, but there's plenty of shining moments throughout those old ones that I feel will make them far more memorable than anything in this one will be. I think this new Hellraiser is less concerned with exploring the same topics of the original movies, and more so focused on giving you a fairly simple slasher movie featuring Cenobites. It's a good idea in theory, but a film like this could have easily been cut down just a bit. There's also the issue of the lighting. There's several scenes in this film that are very poorly lit, which is definitely a bit of a detriment to my enjoyment. Despite these complaints, I did have a fun time with this. I thought the Cenobites were creepy with impressive makeup. The visuals involving the puzzle box were really cool and creative, and I was very entertained by the blood and gore, which was quite grotesque. Maybe this movie's not as deep as the original, but in the end, I did have a lot of fun with it. It delivered exactly the type of gory nonsense that I was hoping to watch this time of year. And I don't think everyone will like this movie, but I did enjoy it just enough to give it a thumbs up. The next movie I watched was actually a MCU special presentation, whatever that means, on Disney Plus titled Werewolf by Night. This is a featured debut for film composer Michael Giacchino, I'm probably butchering that, and it runs at about 50 minutes. It further explores the horror side of the Marvel Universe, which is always nice to see. The film is pretty simple with a lot of odd spooky ideas. I did find there to be a few moments where the special kind of slowed down to explain stuff, 
that I wasn't quite in love with. But I understand why it's there, I just felt like it could have been integrated better so that you don't lose that suspense that you've built up. A Monster Mash is how I describe this film, it offers the comic book insanity I feel is missing from a lot of these films. My critic brain was a bit annoyed by it clearly being shot in color with a bunch of filters thrown over it. But Disney pumps these things out like machines, so it's not surprising that that's the case. Werewolf by Night is no game changer, but what it is, is fun. I feel like it makes a good case for why a horror anthology in the Marvel Universe would actually work really well. If you're already a Marvel fan, you know you'll enjoy this. Otherwise, I'd say a lot of horror fans might be into this too. I'll give it a thumbs up. And then I watched Halloween Ends, and I sure hope it does. This is one of the more divisive Halloween sequels, and one that people either seem to love or hate, although I don't doubt there's some people kind of in the middle. Unfortunately, I'm one of those people that tends to lean more towards hate. The movie was definitely a surprise, it went in a direction none of us could have predicted. By all means, it feels like a film that I should have enjoyed, but at the end of the day, I thought it to be just another poorly made Halloween sequel. Characters are always making stupid decisions that are even dumb by horror standards. Nearly everyone except Laurie Strode is deeply unlikable, which I get is kind of the point, but it's just so hard to enjoy the film when these characters are on screen constantly. Laurie keeps going on long tangents about evil that feels so incredibly basic. It's like a children's Christian cartoon teaching me about good versus bad. Despite the fact that I kind of hated this, I do think a lot of the memes and jokes I've seen about it online are genuinely hilarious. And the movie is probably worth watching just to understand those alone. Still, I give Halloween Ends a thumbs down, but that's just my opinion. Don't let that stop you from checking it out if you are curious. The next movie I watched was Trick or Treat Scooby-Doo, which is really weird because we just had a Halloween Scooby-Doo movie about two years ago, but it's also not something I'm gonna really complain about either. Trick or Treat Scooby-Doo is probably the most unique entry we've had in a while. That is if you're willing to pretend that Scoob doesn't exist, which I've gotten pretty good at. What makes this one unique is its bouncy animation, which at first I thought was gonna be too distracting. But after a while, I found that the animation style and the sense of humor really complemented each other. This is a very unhinged special with more cartoon logic than I'm used to in these direct-to-video movies. It's a nice change of pace from the more lackluster animation we've received over the past few years. This is also the first special where Velma is addressed as being a lesbian. Of course, there was Mystery Incorporated, but that always felt more like a wink-wink, nudge-nudge situation rather than just outright saying it. I thought it was cute and handled well in a way that felt pretty natural to me and not at all preachy. Also, let it be known that Scooby-Doo's continuity is like all over the place, so the whole bisexual versus lesbian debate with her is honestly pretty stupid. A fun time nonetheless, I give Trick or Treat Scooby-Doo a thumbs up. The next film I watched was VHS 99, the fifth film in the VHS horror anthology franchise. These movies are essentially a collection of short films shot on VHS. Well, mostly shot on VHS, they do make some exceptions. Like all horror, each movie is usually a mixed bag, with each short being very hit or miss. So to make it easy, I will just give my incredibly brief thoughts on each short in the order that they play. Shredding. I liked how this short paid tribute to 90s rock demo reels. It's probably the one that best utilizes its 90s setting. Unfortunately, there's not much else to this short. It felt too simple in my opinion. It's probably my least favorite of the bunch. Suicide Bid was my favorite short. It takes the scenario of being trapped in a coffin, something that is already incredibly frightening on its own, and finds a way to incorporate some legitimately frightening ghouls, making it one to remember and a short that I absolutely love. Ozzy's Dungeon is one that pays tribute to 90s Nickelodeon game shows. It's a nice mix of funny and fucked up. I did feel the short went on too long. If it had simplified things and maybe just ended after the game show incident, I think it would have been a perfectly effective and gross short, but it's not bad. I still enjoy this one quite a bit. The Gawkers is one with excellent build-up to kind of a dumb twist. I felt the characters here were well-defined, and I found it to be pretty fun overall. A lesser short in this film, but I wouldn't call it bad either. And finally, we have To Hell and Back, which features a comedic duo being sent to hell. Probably my second favorite of the bunch, I'm a sucker for horror comedy, and this one made me laugh. 
It also has some excellent creature makeup and makes great use of a limited budget. You really do feel like you're in hell for most of it. I could see this working well as a full feature length film. Oh, wait. I guess they kind of already did that. Overall, VHS 99 wasn't the best VHS film, but I still had fun with it. I considered giving it a map, but I got quite a bit of enjoyment out of it, so I'm gonna give it a thumbs up. Next, I watched Black Adam, the film that's gonna save the DC Universe despite being yet another mediocre DC film that does nothing but further complicate the universe. By god, by this point DC really needs to just nuke the DC EU and like start all over because this shit is past the point of saving. Black Adam is a movie that fully delivers on spectacle but is severely lacking in anything beyond that. If you're going to this movie expecting a very dumb, very fun popcorn movie with incredible action scenes, then this movie surely delivers. I will admit that I did have a lot of fun watching it. My main problem with this movie being that I find the character of Black Adam in DC Comics to be quite interesting and this film feels too afraid to do anything risky with him. They keep calling him an anti-hero because he kills people, but everyone he kills completely deserves it, and it's done in such a goofy manner that you barely think about the fact that he just murdered someone. The Rock's acting is not great, and Black Adam himself barely feels like a character. The JSA is a lot of fun, it's just a real shame that their introduction is so rushed. Warner Brothers really needs to start developing their universe before rushing into these things. Now despite these criticisms, it really is the visuals that make this film pop. The best looking DC movie since Zack Snyder's Justice League, and you can tell the VFX artists really put their all into this thing. I mean, half of it looks like a video game cutscene, but I mean that in the best way possible. I did have fun with this, but it's also very hollow. A film that feels too afraid to really commit to its characters or any interesting themes. I'll give it a meh. And finally, on this very long list of movies, we have Henry Selleck's new Netflix film, Wendell and Wild. Unfortunately, Wendell and Wilde is one of Selleck's lesser films. It's a movie that looks absolutely beautiful with breathtaking stop motion and gorgeous character designs. My problem with this movie is that it feels too convoluted. There's way too many characters and too many plot lines to follow, leaving little time for any real character development or any emotional depth. Key and Peele are a lot of fun in this movie, and I enjoyed them as the titular demons. And I commend Henry Selleck for sticking to his spooky aesthetic present in so many of his movies. I could see this being a fun thing to watch around the holiday. Despite this film having a lot of problems, I do think most animation fans will enjoy it. I'm going to give it a meh, but I would still recommend it on the animation alone. So that's it for all of the movies I watched in October. I am nearly finished with that Ninja Turtles fast forward video, so expect that to drop soon-ish. Thank you for watching, and goodbye.